Aandara, a site covered in the past, yet for an entirely different reason. Our experience along this path of discovery, now allowing one a window, a glimpse, into a deeper, more compounding layer of evidential detail. Unraveling a tangled web of lies, weaved over generations of regurgitated fiction. Accompanied by supportive evidence to, again, reinforce the original instinctual hypothesis created some 10 years ago now. In particular, in regard to who could have, in reality, possibly created these mind-blowing or gargantuan ancient megalithic ruins. Sites we have touched upon or researched in the past, however from a less experienced evidential angle. Thus we feel they are justified a refined revisit. Yet I digress. Aandara is a claimed Iron Age settlement. Yet what I am about to demonstrate is that not only is this yet another lie, but that the evidence be overwhelming to support this claim. The choice of stone used in these once exquisitely finished ruins decoration, for example, not only reminiscent of Persepolis, but due to its clearly much greater level of erosion, it would also, as the art would suggest, far predate Persepolis itself. Yet the belief structure, the artistic evolution, and by default, the same civilization responsible for both and indeed the mythological depictions are undeniably linked. Aandara being located in Syria and claimed as dating as far back as the Iron Age. We have covered the magnificent Lamassu, found within Persepolis within a two-part special previously. This extraordinary, seemingly superhumanly precise stone-carved sanctuary, however, although clearly possessing a more advanced depiction of the same creatures found at an apparent Iron Age basalt site, which is actually geographically over 1500 kilometers away and dated to a completely different era, regardless of academic opinion, share unarguable evidential similarity and due to erosion levels can be correlated with the evolution of the depictions along with the civilization responsible's past yet now lost abilities. From Aandara to the Lamassu of Persepolis is clearly an artistic evolution of the mythical creatures depicted on the basalt stones claimed as Iron Age within Aandara. Furthermore, although only a suspiciously tiny portion remains of the basalt floor, a quietly guarded area found at the foot of Cheops upon the Giza Plateau, or more accurately foundation although only a remnant of what once was probably one of the most significant parts of the ancient ruins themselves, it still holds countless undeniable curious tool marks, each of which clearly made with a tool unarguably tremendously more powerful and capable than that of what academics claim the builders of the pyramids and their constructors wielded, that of copper tools. It all but now seems an insult to one's intelligence. We clearly find Aandara highly compelling. When people visit the southeastern Anatolian province of Mardin, this gem of lost antiquity quietly sits, often overlooked, and when one begins to investigate said site, they are often left with more questions than answers. For why does such an astonishing ruin go largely unnoticed? Why is it not more largely discussed within archaeological circles? Could it be due to the fact, as one with any level of knowledge regarding lost civilizations and the proof therein latches eyes upon the site, they instantly recognize its characteristics synonymous with these studies, matching other, yet rather interestingly, accidentally revealed ruins from around the world? The style of, and the decision to bore the dwellings from solid stone, reminiscent of many unexplained ruins such as the underground city of Derinkuyu, a particularly interesting site when indeed discovered entirely by accident, one which to this day remains heavily debated and to some highly controversial. This site, known as Dara, is exhibiting geological processes which are now, unfortunately, beginning to erode it back into the landscape. The construction technique, however, still testament to its original builder's abilities and indeed its possible age. 
Yet this does not answer the question as to why this ruin goes largely untalked of, largely unstudied and overlooked. For parallel to the erosion argument exhibiting its true age, it can also be used as an advocate for its official dating within the Byzantine era. The lack of surviving ruins will often be used as a way to dismiss such claims of antiquity due to a lack of evidence. Thus, we wanted to dig a little deeper to see if, via visual evidence, we could confirm that there is indeed reason to suspect that the site could possibly generate controversy for those who originally dated the site. This to confirm our initial suspicions. Still, surviving tool marks present upon the stones match that of other controversially dated sites. How can a ruin apparently dating from the Bronze Age exhibit such long cut marks or finishes across the stone? Like that of the ancient pyramids, how could copper tools have accomplished such feats within Dara, Giza, and the other sites around the world? It is a question which we find highly compelling. Here at Mystery History, we cover the unexplained areas of antiquity, either ignored, avoided, dismissed, or simply given an incomplete or often illogical historical lifeline of existence by mainstream academia, particularly those which we have covered of significant size, quarried from many miles away now often immovable, and once transported, and either erected or placed atop one another seemingly effortlessly. We were, in a past series of investigations, looking into an interesting quarry within the Bazda cave system on the edge of Turkey, a place with particularly good granite and a proven source of stone for numerous megalithic sites many miles around. Later, proven by us via the preserved linkages in tool marks to have been used by more than one group, as if they had coalesced at this particular site. Yet, as mentioned, we have long argued that not just one advanced civilization capable of moving and cutting these incredibly monumental megalithic stones have been and gone. And we feel we have and continue to provide sufficient proof of these claims. The Colossi of Memnon, said to have once sang at sunrise, are both made of stones thousands of tons in weight, yet are eroding to dust along with countless others, yet clearly once precisely cut, just like all the other stone ruins we cover worldwide. Yet sites like Petra and the polygonal casing stones found in some most curious of places such as the pyramids of Egypt preserving stones in a similar condition to the Colossi. Certain stone monuments of gigantic size, found and stored in near-perfect condition, are found in these same areas, as if somehow spared catastrophe. Does this prove a sudden great flood? They regardless, we claim, prove several cycles of activity at stone-cutting creation. Were some monuments submerged and therefore preserved under the sediments? like those secretly removed from the pyramids and sphinx during initial investigations? Were they attacked by a geological event? The perfect preservation of some of these statues must eliminate sandware as a possibility. The pursuit to the answers to these questions become closer, and we feel highly compelling. One of the things crucial for any civilization to flourish is a steady and abundant supply of clean, fresh water. It is the lifeblood of our planet, arguably the most fought-over resource on Earth. Without it, crops fail, sewage is not effectively flushed away, and a lack of it will cause dehydration and death in an incredibly short space of time, depending on where one were to find themselves. Thus, for our posit of ancient, advanced civilizations, with populations well into the millions, to hold any water, a civilization we believe continues to bestow upon us advanced knowledge, ingenious solutions to the most difficult of problems, such as water manipulation and the irrigation thereof, would be present. The management and general manipulation of water should in all accounts be present amongst these sites in which we claim to be the work of now lost civilizations, 
and that is indeed what one finds. There is endless discussion within peer-review papers and academic circles by regurgitation, seemingly lacking the faculty for critical thinking as they continue to look upon these ingenious ancient solutions for getting water to places that it should simply not be as simply wonderful all incapable of considering that these people who created these structures, although they did not build skyscrapers, may not have been of a primitive nature, with far less capable tools than modern man. This again, I might add, a denial continued when one looks upon the size of megalithic blocks moved through these lost ages of antiquity. Yet I digress. The following ancient water technique is nothing short of astonishing, and the work that must have gone into its construction unimaginable. Not surprisingly, it is an ancient marvel that did not escape the attention of William R. Corliss. Known as Kanats, they are literal underground ancient man-made rivers, built slightly underground for the purposes of shade from the searing sun, found in most of the locations you find the Kanats. This, of course, also minimized evaporation considerably, inevitably allowing the water to travel unimaginably further into dry and inhospitable locations. These ancient man-made oases, yet another example of not only ancient man's abilities, knowledge, and dedication to overcome obstacles, but also a clue as to how many people these, what we believe are now lost civilizations who abruptly vanished, housed at an unknown time in history. For such enormous volumes of water are only needed for an equally enormous population, possibly once located somewhere nature wouldn't have allowed, yet with their advanced knowledge of irrigation systems, they flourished within. Kanats are yet another incredible remnant left by an advanced civilization, which we undoubtedly find incredibly compelling. Previously, we covered the strange but highly intriguing Cockno Stone, an extremely ancient and very large Scottish stone, covered with some of the best and most interesting ancient petroglyphs known in Europe. And although we put forward the preposition of it possibly being a map of as yet unknown star constellations, we were subsequently contacted by an independent researcher known as Sean Moriarty, who, with a small independent team, has been investigating the stone for quite some time, resulting in them deciphering the enigmatic cup and ring marks as a map of all the ancient sites within the surrounding area, including some yet to be unearthed. However, there is a little less known ancient stone, a stone which rests in North Carolina, deep within the mountains of Jackson County, and it has baffled all but a few who've examined it. Known as the Judicula Rock, it is a soapstone boulder covered with a plethora of strange petroglyphic drawings that archaeologists now believe to be over 3,000 years old. The native Cherokee Indians consider the site sacred and state that it's extremely ancient. The rock has been studied by researchers from across the world, but no one was ever able to decipher the bizarre petroglyphs on the stone, not even being able to connect them vaguely to any usual subject matter often selected for such ancient expressions. It's also cut using an unknown technique made by an unknown people. The stone sits at the base of a mountain that has a large vein of copper which runs under the site. With a variety of other rare metals and minerals present, this geological layout has often been used to explain the strange electromagnetic anomalies which can be detected around the rock. The League of Energy Materialization and Unexplained Phenomena Research, or LEMA for short, a team of highly qualified individuals who explore paranormal and enigmatic subjects, may have actually cracked the code, and their research is certainly the most compelling proposition so far put forward or quite possibly will ever be put forward. In August of 2002, Lima investigated Judicula rock. Upon comparing Judicula's markings to microscopic forms, specifically microscopic pond life, some of which exclusively native to the surrounding landscape, an artistic relationship becomes undeniable. Modern academia, or indeed known history, states that man first saw microscopic creatures in September 1674. 
These observations were made by Dutch scientist Anton van Leeuwenhoek. That means humans have only known of microscopic life for less than 330 years. If this is true, who or what could have created the Judah Kula stone's markings over 3,000 years ago? Was this stone made by a highly advanced ancient alien? Was it made with the purpose of sharing their research with a local population unable of such work? To date, the Lima theory is the only one which has been successfully corroborated elsewhere.